Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Today I'm visiting Steve Steidman. He's a professor at the CUNY School of Law and he directs the clinic, the Criminal Defense Clinic. He's also known all over as a leader in the, in the drive for clemencies and, and the movement to reduce the prison population. So hello, Steve, how are you? Good, Ronnie, glad to be with you. <laughs> Good. So, you know, what, let's talk about the purpose of prison. Don't you think that's a basic thing? That it depends on what people think of why people are sentenced to serve certain terms. Yeah, I think the purpose of prison, it's gotten lost because you go into the court system and numbers are thrown around 20, 30, 40, 50 years without anybody thinking, why are we doing this? Is it just to punish? Is it to rehabilitate? Frankly, from my perspective, what it boils down to is everyone involved in the system just wants to take the person who's been convicted, lock them up, forget about them, and not give any careful thought about to the purpose. And the reason I say that is because if you thought about the purpose of prison, why are we sending people there? You would have to reconsider people's sentences over time. And that's something that there has been just incredible resistance to doing at every level. I've always felt when I've visited anybody in the prison, I always have this feeling uh, there, but for the grace of God goes I. Because sometimes it's just over the line and that's it and you've done it. And for the rest of your life, you're never gonna be able to, to, to convince people that that was then and this is now, you know? Yeah, I, Ronnie, I couldn't agree more. And, and it's not just, well, I guess related to the idea of there, but for the grace of God, I've been doing this work for a number of years, and I have worked with so many students from so many different backgrounds, and I have yet to meet a student who didn't meet someone they were working with in prison. And I'm talking about people who have been convicted of very serious crimes. Mm -hmm. I have yet to meet a student come away and say, boy, this person should never get out. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, you sit, you meet someone, you talk to someone, you begin to, de to develop a relationship, and everyone comes back saying, my God, why is this person still incarcerated after 20, 30, 40 years? They're not the same person they were. They have so much to offer. And if we could build that into this system somehow, some degree of person-to-person -person humanity, I think we would address the, the entire problem of mass incarceration. It, it, part of it, you wish that people on the parole board would know these people or would at least have gone to meet them or at least would be interviewing them in person. I mean, I was shocked, really to find that the hearings, a parole hearing, is one person sitting there and, and looking at a camera. I mean, that's, you can't, how can you judge somebody's progress or change or what's inside of them? You can't. Yeah, that's just one example of, you know, I was about to say a broken parole system, but you know, some people view it as this is exactly what it's supposed to do, giving short shrift to people who are in prison. Right. Because it's not, you know, it's not just that you're, you're not meeting someone. You're not getting a sense of a person. You know, it's who are the members of the parole board? What special qualifications do they have? And if you just think about that, if we were creating a system, who are the people we would want to judge whether someone has transformed, has been rehabilitated? You would want social workers, clinicians, formerly incarcerated people. Instead, we just have a random group of folks put on the parole board, usually for some political reasons, so they lack any kind of skill or qualifications to make this life, frankly, it's a matter of life and death decision for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And then when you add to the mix, they're getting a file, usually 10 minutes before they're interviewing someone. You know, I had one guy explain it to me this way. He had been sentenced to 25 to life for something that happened when he was 17 years old. There was an argument, a movie theater, shots were fired, one kid was killed. It's horrific, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. And he got the maximum sentence, 25 to life. And he said he began preparing for that 25 year moment, his parole board, the day he got to prison, preparing, taking classes, programs, thinking about he was, what he was gonna say. And it became clear to him after 10 seconds of his parole interview that no one had read anything of what he had submitted, really knew nothing about him. The process took 15 minutes and they denied him parole and said, we'll see you in two years. It is a horrific system. They, it seems, I've heard that they automatically usually deny parole the first time before the board. In particular, for, for people who are convicted of serious violent crimes. I think that's true. Now, the whole question of serious crimes, I mean, 
people who are convicted of felonies and either sentenced in federal prison or in state prisons, they're considered different from people uh, convicted of violent felonies, right? Yeah, violent felonies are this bridge too far for a lot of, even for a lot of people who are interested in being reformers. Mm. So if you think about it, in the present context of COVID-19, which is, it's a crisis of epic proportions everywhere, but in particular in facilities like nursing homes and prisons. Mm -hmm. And you look at what governors across the country, what our governor is doing, is to the extent he's doing anything at all, he always starts by saying, we are going to look at people convicted of nonviolent crimes. Right. So you already remove tens of thousands of people from any kind of consideration. And a good number of those people are like you, the person you just described before, people who are 16, 17, 18 committed a crime, and now they can be 55 years old and they're still in prison. It, exactly. I mean, we have... The numbers, I, I believe it's something like over 9,000 people in New York State Prison are over 50 years old. And it, 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 it flies in the face of, of um, compassion, decency, humanity, and also uh, empirical data. Because every study that's ever done anywhere shows that people age out of criminal behavior. So they're no threat to public safety, yet they languish in prison for no reason at all other than just eternal punishment. And the other side of it is, of course, that it costs money, right? Yeah. That somebody, I read someplace, I'm looking at this note, 8,625 sentences of 20 years, 40 years, 50, and 75 years to life. Yeah. Now, so when we talked about mass incarceration, we weren't only talking about putting people in prison, we're talking about keeping them in prison. Well said. Yep. It's not just, it's not just a matter of the number of people we arrest, it's the sentences that are imposed. They are draconian and off the charts by any measure, including anywhere you want to look in the world. I've, I've noticed that you've written a lot about judges and whether they should be elected or appointed and what happens to them. What do you, what is your, how do you feel about that? Uh, well, you know, as a general proposition, I think it makes much more sense for judges to be appointed rather than elected. And you know, because you know, I guess we can make the argument both ways, but here's what I've seen when you look nationally, when judges are elected, they tend to appeal to, I think the, whatever is the opposite of the better angels of our nature, you know, that I'm gonna lock up more people, that I'm gonna be tough on crime. So in particular in the criminal courts, the elections tend to devolve into who's gonna meet out the heaviest sentences. I'll give you one other example. There was a study done years ago where judges who are up for re-election, so mm -hmm. you get a 10-year term, say, now in your ninth year, you're up for re-election, the sentences they imposed, including the death penalty, spiked in the year before their election, as they were appealing what they thought to what they thought the electorate wanted to hear. So from my perspective, the elect, and, and plus nobody knows anything about the judges. Mm -hmm. You're pulling a lever, you, you don't know the first thing about it, it's a, it's a low salient issue. So yeah, I much prefer a merit system. You put the right kind of people in a room to determine who has the right qualifications to do this work. It's a political thing. I mean, I, I was elected a delegate to the judicial convention a couple of years ago in, in that district. I was shocked, totally shocked at it. I mean, and I had never been to one of these things. So a person gets nominated and then a second and a speech, and then there's a second and second day speech. Then the person gets up and makes a speech. And then the person says, but I'm withdrawing my name because it isn't my time yet. That's right, that's right. <laughs> and there it, it was, was the political influence. The county leader is sitting up there. It's just shocking. Anyway. <laughs> it, it is, it's, it's shocking. And for some reason, there's never been a light that anybody has really shined on it in, in the sort of serious way it needs to be done. It is, it's political patronage, political payback. We know that. There used to be a man named Stanley Z Geller. Have you ever heard of him? I have not. He, he had set up an advise, he had set up a panel that advised them. And I know Lindsay, for instance, took his word. He, he was overly zealous about the selection of judges. Anyway, the difference between federal judges, now they are appointed, but are their terms mandated? Well, they get lifetime appointments. Yeah. 
And there's something to be said for that. I mean, you can argue the pros and cons, but here's the, in the current era, yeah, here's no. the pro. <laughs> the pro of it is that they can do something a little bit more controversial and not worry that they're going to lose their job. Mm -hmm. So for example, again, just bringing this to COVID-19 again, because it's at the forefront of all our minds, you know, we're filing writs across New York State. We are asking judges to release older and ill people who are at risk, frankly, of dying if they are infected by COVID-19, which is running rampant across the prisons. And to date, there's been a single, you know, the, the, judge, let's put it this way. I, I didn't want to overstate it, but the overwhelming majority of New York State judges just deny these writs outright. They pay no attention to them. Then you look in the federal court and you see people getting out, uh, mobsters getting their sentences reduced. You see um, Michael, you know, Paul Manafort uh, right. coming home, Dean Skelos coming home. There's an issue about our own governor, his former friend, Joseph Prococo. Is he gonna get released early under concerns about COVID-19? And yet in New York State, it, you, are, you have to search high and low for a profile in courage. Yeah, you've um, you've now you're specializing at the moment. I think I don't know if you're that's a wrong word, but anyway, you're doing a lot of appeals to the governor for clemency. What yes. does that entail? Well, the clemency process it's um it's very interesting because it's completely unregulated, which I think is the wonderful thing about it, frankly. So in our state constitution, the governor has virtually unfettered power to commute someone's sentence. You could have been sentenced to 100 to life and have been in 20 years. With the stroke of a pen, the governor can say, you know what, I'm commuting your sentence to the time you've been in. Go home, do good things, and goodbye and good luck. Uh, the problem has been that New York's governor, frankly, like most governors, has been miserly in his approach to clemency. They trickle out. Uh, I think he's issued a grand total of 20 sentence commutations, and there are thousands on his desk. So from my perspective, there are deserving people, there are people who deserved clemency before anyone ever heard of the coronavirus. Yeah. Now so many people are supplementing their applications saying, I have diabetes, I have had, um, I have lung cancer, I'm at such risk, will you consider my clemency application in light of that? And to date, it hasn't moved the governor one bit. It was a big disappointment, wasn't it? Because a couple of years ago, he established a procedure to increase the number of clemency appeals. Yeah, he did. He established a procedure to his credit, and he built it as the first of its kind in the nation. It was a pro bono program. So if anybody wanted a lawyer to assist them with clemency, anybody inside, all they had to do was check a box. Uh, the problem is, well, there were two problems. One is, frankly, in the legal profession, not enough lawyers stepped up. But the far bigger problem was it ended up being a, it was false hope because hundreds of applications were submitted and the governor's, you know, his record of granting clemency is, you know, less than one third of 1%. So he held out hope that here was this program. And I can tell you this, Ronnie, when that came out, I got buried in letters, phone calls, emails from people inside and their families because they saw hope yeah. and it's just been dashed. Do you, can you explain the procedure in, in Albany when you, you file a thing? Who reads it? And is there an office that handles them or does it just get spread around with lawyers? Yeah, it's somewhat opaque, but there is an executive clemency bureau, which is part of New York's Department of Corrections and Community Supervision. So you send your application to them and the application, there's no, it's, the application is what you put into it. It's here's who the person is today, here's their reentry plan, here's their personal statement, here's all they've achieved while inside. It goes to the Executive Clemency Bureau. Let me but just what, add one thing, the letters yeah. of support. Oh, sure, critical. Letters That's of support. That's a major thing, isn't it? Yes, from family members, from, and from people inside, mm -hmm. from the superintendent of the prison, from correction officers, from other people who are incarcerated with that person, from formerly incarcerated people. Sure, the letters of support are, are critical, but what seems very clear, and, and this I sort of, I understand this, it goes from this executive clemency bureau, and then ultimately it gets to the governor's more like his inner circle, his counsel's office, and they decide which ones they're going to try and move further up the chain until it lands on the governor's desk. 
what criteria they apply, Ronnie, I couldn't tell you. It's just, and, you, and then you wait, right? You wait forever. That's the cruelest thing, I think, that because people are used to having, it, it's become the thing to do it around Christmas and New Year's. It's sure. like that, and instead of, the, and that's so bad, because instead of making that decision based on how the prisoner has changed and is, is really, should be out, it's, it's premises, it's like a gift to you. All right, here's your Christmas present. <laughs> exactly. And, and you know, I think that does two things. Well, first of all, the idea that there's this buildup, that it's going to be done around Christmas time, I think that's actually what causes most governors, certainly our governor here in New York, mm -hmm. to be so miserly. Because right. I start getting phone calls from the press mid-November. What do you hear about clemency? What do you hear about clemency? And it starts building up all this pressure and everyone's paying attention. My advice to the governor, to his staff, has been, why aren't you doing this on a regular basis? No one would really care that much. The press wouldn't get all worked up about it. And the other part of it, Ronnie, you know, you mentioned it about it, that it's been cast as this act of charity, which I certainly understand. But here's what we're missing. You have 40,000 something people in New York State Prison. They have so much to offer. So there's a benefit to all of us on the outside. We reunite families. We rebuild communities. There are people who have learned so much who want to give back. And instead, we just have them languishing in prison. It's a loss to everybody. So sure, there's an element of charity and mercy, but it's much bigger than that. And they also will go back into a community, at least a lot of them, and talk with young people. Yes. And really be the best counselors. I mean, a lot, what a good percentage of them become drug counselors or yeah. other kind of in the community, right? Because yeah, there's a phrase, a wonderful phrase that I've learned from exactly those people. They call themselves the credible messengers. I mean, the what? Who better? The yeah. credible messengers. Yeah. Who better to talk to young people right. than someone, as they've said to me, I've walked those same streets, I've been in their shoes, and I have a lot that I can pass along. And don't do it again. Yeah. There's a, a bill in, in in the state legislature that anybody who has served more than 15 years, is that it, or 55 years old? Or what? It's the combination, you have to be do both? Yeah, it's the combination. You have to be 55 or over and have served 15 years. And all it means is that you would have an opportunity to make your case to the parole board. So if you are 60 years old, you, you were given 50 to life when you were 30. Mm -hmm. You won't see the parole board till you are 80 if you live that long in prison and the odds of that are pretty slim. So what this law is saying is, you know what, we are just gonna give you an opportunity. You're over 55, you've served more than 15 years. Let's see if that sentence is still appropriate. And to me, it is such an overdue bill that there's this idea, and I say this now as going back in time to when I was a public defender, a sentence is imposed, a sentence like 50 to life. And at that moment, the idea that it's that 50 to life sentence is gonna remain just and appropriate in perpetuity is ludicrous. Mm. Yet under the present system, we don't revisit it for mm. 50 years. So this bill is trying to address that fundamental problem. So do you think that after the election, since this is an election year for state legislators, that there may be more support? I, I hope so. Really go at, you know, really go after it. Yeah, there, there, there are a number of elected officials who do support the bill. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm mildly optimistic. Yes. Good. That would, and that, and you know, well, of course, that's the the national thing with the uh, Koch brothers that the financial end of it. But we really need more of the other end, our end of it, right? <laughs> Yeah, so I'll tell you about the financial piece. There is something, you know, and I hate to even, it's a critical piece of this, yeah. but to me, it, it takes the discussion away from basic humanity. But if you think about it, $70,000 a year is the estimated cost for one person. And in an era right now where, just think how many ventilators, how much PPE, not to mention how much support we could give all those people right now who are suffering from such economic distress, mm if the governor would finally release the thousands, and Ronnie, I'm talking thousands of people who are radically transformed, who are no threat to public safety and have so much to offer. You're talking millions and millions of dollars. So incredible. Now, can we just talk for a minute about the, uh, your CUNY School of Law? 
Do you have any graduates that become prosecutors? Um, very few. Very few. Yeah. You've taught at several law schools. Is there a difference in this law school? Uh, there is very much a difference, yeah. I mean, and that's the purpose of the school. I mean, that, that's its mission is to train social justice lawyers. So, you know, in the other law schools that I've taught, there's a heavy emphasis, and this is no surprise to people who are familiar with the legal community. Yeah. You know, law students want to be corporate lawyers. Yeah. Um, at CUNY, our mission is law in the service of human needs. So we attract students who really are looking to make whatever contribution they can to the underserved in areas where people and places are under-resourced, really trying to make a difference. And I know that sounds like public relations, but I've been at CUNY now since 2002 and I've seen it. Mm -hmm. So our students go out there really looking to see where they can, where's the value added from their legal education? What can they bring to somehow make some situation better, whether it's housing court, criminal court, uh, immigration, and all these mass deportations? That, that kind of typifies the CUNY student. So what, what is the criminal defense um, clinic? Tell me about that. Sure. That's our students. Um, they do a, a variety of criminal justice work. We like to think of criminal defense sort of broadly defined. Mm -hmm. So we represent people charged with crimes in the New York City criminal court. We represent people who have been denied parole repeatedly and repeatedly, both in their appeals as well as helping them prepare for the next parole interview. And we do an awful lot of clemency work. And the clemency work we focus on are those people who have been really um, ignored. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean they're serving 50, 75 to life. So they will never see a parole board. You know, you get 75 to life when you're 30 years old. New York, we are a uh, truth and sentencing state. You have to do that minimum number. So you could you then apply for clemency to reduce the number? Of yes. I, the, to reduce the sentence. Right. Yeah, you, you're doing 75 to life. You can say, look, I've done half the minimum and look how well I've done. Look at who I am now. Would you please commute my sentence? Yeah, so that's a help. So the students actually go into the prisons. Oh, sure. Yeah. You're making it all sound so, ex I mean, I, you're not making it. It is a very exciting thing. I wish I was younger and I could go to law school. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the, what was the oldest student? I don't know. <laughs> uh, they, we, have a, we have a pretty wide age range at CUNY yeah. that also, I think, distinguishes us. And you, you, you've, it must be a wonderful place for you. It, it's a, per, you know, I'm, I'm just thrilled. I feel myself so fortunate. It is, um, it, it's, you know, there's a corny phrase you hear a lot of faculty members say it at law schools, colleges, all over the place about how much you learn from your students. And I think most people mean it. I meant it when I taught at other places, but I have never experienced it to the degree that I do at CUNY. We have students coming from different backgrounds. They bring, they, they have job experience. They tend to be older. They bring personal experience. A lot of them have experience with the criminal legal system. So yeah, I get the benefit of learning every, every, every day from my students. I feel blessed. So thank you, Steve. This has been such an interesting discussion and I hope we have some more. I look forward to it, Ronnie. Stay well. Thank you, you too. Bye. Okay, bye-bye now.